Thanks. Uh, thank you to Dana and Eric for, for joining us today and giving a talk on energy poverty. Uh, we're, we're very excited to have them. This is a, an important issue that, um, that, that really affects quite a, a huge number of people, and, and I'm sure they'll share more information about that with us. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dana and Eric and let them take over. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and, and thank you, John. Can you uh, confirm you can hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you clearly. All right, great. Thanks. Um, so thank you. We, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of our work. Um, today, uh, as John mentioned, we'll be giving a high-level overview of uh, energy poverty and talking about some of our uh, recent work here at TEPRI. Um, we're really excited to be able to present uh, the landscape of existing research on energy poverty and some of our key takeaways and conclusions. Um, this, this talk is actually an overview of our forthcoming paper, uh, which should be available in the next couple of weeks, and um, we're happy to, to provide it to any of the attendees um, of this webinar upon request. So um, as John mentioned, um, Eric von Kalzer of Research into Action is, is my co-author on this study and uh, will be jointly presenting today. And we'd also like to acknowledge and thank our third co-author, uh, Matt Haley, who's a grad student at UT, and he, he really did a lot of the, the heavy lifting for this paper. So first, uh, let me give me a little bit of background on, on TEPRI. Uh, we are a collaboration of power market participants, uh, community action agencies, affordable housing providers, and other stakeholders working together to inspire lasting energy solutions for low-income communities. We are a 501c3 nonprofit based here in Austin, um, and we actually just hit our, our one-year anniversary. Um, our organization was formed because we'd like to better understand and address energy and fuel poverty in Texas. You know, it's, it's really an exciting time to be in the energy sector. Um, there are lots of amazing new technologies and evolving business models, for sure, and, and definitely a lot of change. Our goal is to make sure that with all this change, the solutions of tomorrow are designed with the needs of all within our communities considered. Um, we're very thankful for the support of our member utilities and stakeholders coming together to, to place emphasis on this important topic. At TEPRI, we see energy as a basic and fundamental need. Uh, energy keeps us safer, healthier, and more productive. Um, and access is something that many of us are fortunate to be able to take for granted. Nearly 5 million households in Texas live below the poverty line. The term energy poverty can have various definitions in the literature, but we use it to refer to a situation where the cost of energy needed to maintain a healthy lifestyle creates a significant or unnecessary economic burden. Energy costs and poverty have a very direct relationship. In America, for every 10% increase in home energy costs, 840,000 people will be pushed below the poverty line. The consequences can be quite severe. The Texas State Data Center estimates that low-income households can spend an average of 12.5% of their income on home energy costs versus about 4% spent by other households. Burdens are grow more acute as we move towards more severe poverty, up to 31% of income. You can imagine if that much of your income is going towards energy, it can be quite difficult to pay to keep a, the cost of a roof over your head. And so people end up making trade-offs for the basics, having to choose between keeping the lights on, paying rent or mortgage, and putting food on the table for their families. The effects of these trade-offs can range from physical and mental health consequences like asthma, depression, to environmental consequences, and even eviction and homelessness. Our population in Texas is, is, is increasing substantially, and funding is decreasing or gone for low-income initiatives. Almost 20% of Hispanics are living in poverty right now, and the Hispanic population in Texas is expected to double by 2050. The System Benefit Fund was intended to provide energy relief benefits to large numbers of Texans through a paid program called Light Up Texas, but that fund was decommissioned in 2016. The Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, and the Weatherization Assistance Program are administered by federal block grants 
But with the new administration, the future is uncertain. And my heap is already only covering less than 2% of the eligible population. With this, we feel that we must find other solutions to re reduce severe energy burdens for the vulnerable neighbors in our communities. This graphic is an attempt to add a framework to the various factors surrounding energy poverty. The picture is a bit complex, but our hope is that together we can begin to address each of these factors and have a real impact. The way the chart is drawn, the first layer shows what I'm calling kind of first order factors that very directly affect energy poverty. We'll go into more detail to that when we dive into the research, but things like housing type and quality, energy efficiency measures, access to renewables, and importantly, our ability to engage with customers are these direct factors. The outside layer shows more second order factors, which are perhaps less direct, but present very important relationships we'd like to understand. For example, relationships between energy and health, uh, energy and education, and even energy and transportation. The way the chart's drawn towards the left kind of represents more the power sector or energy, consider, uh, energy industry considerations, and towards the right uh, moves more towards people and quality of life. Now, this is it's a working graphic, but as we gain a better understanding of energy poverty in Texas, our hope is to develop a kind of heat maps of our understanding and over time develop a detailed picture of each of the factors and the relationships in order to develop innovative solutions that serve low income customers. This slide shows a series of maps that I found useful to begin to identify the segments of energy poverty in our state. The map on the left is the population density uh, with more dense areas highlighted in dark green. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, rural versus urban living has real mm -hmm. implications on housing characteristics and therefore on energy consumption. The middle map is a density of households below the poverty line in Texas, with the, the dark red being over 15%. Um, this data is actually by census tract, so here we've got a little bit more detail to work with than by the by population, but you have the idea. Um, and then on the far right is a map of the transmission and distribution utilities in the competitive retail areas. Uh, the unshaded areas represent municipal utilities, co-ops, and IOUs, um, including outside of ERCOT. Um, it's an incomplete picture, but, but useful nonetheless, because if you can imagine overlaying the three maps, you can almost create fingerprints of different low-income communities and their interactions with utilities in Texas. Our premise is that if we can find solutions that work for given, a given fingerprint, um, either within Texas or, or outside the state, it may be worth trying that and other uh, given communities with the same fingerprint. Very quickly, I'd like to talk a little bit about TEPRI's path to impact. Ultimately, we are a research organization, and our activities and products include research, education, and facilitating stakeholder discussions. The outcomes we intend to achieve from those activities um, include increased program effectiveness, equitable opportunities for participation in the electricity transition, data-driven policy, and where possible, market-based solutions. And at the end of the day, really what we're trying to accomplish um, is an impact of reduced energy burdens on low-income communities um, in Texas and ideally across the nation. Of course, none of this would be possible without our network of members, underwriters, and research partners. And we're very thankful for the support uh, of these organizations that makes this work possible, but also uh, really for the shared focus and the passion on our mission to work together to inspire lasting energy solutions for low-income communities across the country. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the overview of TEPRI. Now we can uh, get into the research itself. Um, we're delighted to be able to present the work from our, our energy poverty uh, research landscape analysis. The forthcoming paper presents findings from a year-long energy poverty research effort. Um, and the, the working paper is under final review, but it'll be made publicly available in mid-May. So uh, consider this presentation your early access to the results, I guess. Um, and, and really, this, this paper, this effort, is a precursor to an energy poverty clearinghouse effort. Um, this will be an online rep repository of all of the works covered by this paper, um, as well as additional relevant resources over time. 
um, and the tools intended for use by the industry and its service to low-income consumers. Um, the applications of both this paper and ultimately the clearinghouse are to develop a foundation for state and national level discussion to guide better program design, uh, to inform policy, influence outreach and education, and to develop future research. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Eric to take us through the methodology and some of the key points of the study. Okay, thanks. So uh, again, my name is Eric Funkhauser. Uh, I, uh, I'm a senior consultant with a technology uh, uh, research company called Research in Action. We primarily focus on uh, energy efficiency, smart grid, renewable energy uh, related research and largely from the kind of consumer and economics perspective. Um, so I uh, got involved and tied up with Dana in this project uh, uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, and we started out basically with a fundamental question around how do we, uh, how do we want to go about uh, mm -hmm. figuring out the uh, the landscape and what is the uh, what are the right parameters to um, to set uh, to make an interesting product and to give you a little bit of an insight into where we why we why we took the approach we did you know uh, Tepri's goal is not simply to find what's going on and you know uh, have a a lot of internal kind of facility with the uh, with the resources that are out there, but to educate and to be a thought leader on those topics. So we started out fundamentally wanting something that was super usable to the audiences that are in greatest need of access to these insights. So uh, what we decided to do was to focus on trying to understand the state of play around energy poverty research over the past decade or so. And the intent was that the results should be useful primarily and that they should be accessible um, for um, to help uh, research organizations, nonprofits, policymakers, industry improve their actual tactical on the ground uh, activities. So a place where they can go to understand what is the current state of play. Um, so that was that was where we started. And and then you know when we started thinking from that strategy, there's a big departure between the research that's out there and what the kind of the frontier of knowledge versus what people that use this tactical, uh, that who do the tactical work actually have access to. So a lot of studies are behind paywalls and it's just not, uh, our assumption is that it's not a reasonable expectation to think that a lot of the folks doing the tactical work on the ground are gonna have multiple licenses to go or, or time to get into the deep kind of theoretical research that's coming out of academia. So we limited uh, our work to um, studies and reports that are available in the public domain. Um, so there are a lot of white paper and open source academic materials that made it into our analysis, but they had to be something that was available, not behind a paywall. Um, so once we kind of got down the, 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 the bottom line of what we were trying to do and what we wanted to accomplish, um, we uh, went back uh, at Research in Action and we developed with our team of sociologists, we develop a, a, a methodology that would um, allow us to, um, to produce a full systematic landscape analysis. And our landscape analysis focused on research topics. So just to be clear about that, what we, we didn't set out to discriminate between strong and weak studies or you know, aggregate findings for a meta-analysis. We wanted to understand where the bulk of publicly available research has focused, um, and that's primarily what we're covering. Where where has the, where have the lights been on um, over the past decade or so for low and moderate income uh, energy poverty research? Um, so uh, that's that's what I'm going to discuss here, and that's what the white paper covers. Um, just uh, pointing a little bit to the future. One issue. One one. One aspect of this particular methodology that we appreciated is that um, we will at some point be able to look beyond um, simply what the uh, what what topics have been prominent over the last decade, but we can also later do some gap analysis and hopefully determine a bit of what's been lacking and where greater focus is, and, and uh, help us here with the organizational mission for TEPRI. Um, so uh, just a, a brief word. 
uh, wrapping up here on the methodology. So um, we uh, uh, ended up pulling in thousands and thousands of different reports uh, after using a systematic approach for um, uh, pulling them into, um, into our database. And then we down selected based on a quality criteria, um, the quality of the research, um, and come up with a, a smaller um, subset of about five to six hundred um, uh, reports. And it's those five or six hundred reports that we analyze uh, that from which we kind of derive this topic analysis. So just to get started, so I'm going to um, begin. Uh, and introduce a couple of the, um, the areas of research that we explored. So uh, within, it, when you get the white paper, within each of these areas, we kind of, we break out uh, key aspects within kind of high level, um, high level research areas. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what we, uh, what we uh, found around energy burdens. So before going into the details, let me tell you about the graphic on your screen. So this is a higher level representation of the primary causes and effects and, uh, and barriers. So you can see uh, some of the high level effects would be, or sorry, high level causes of energy burdens. They stem back to things like the, the financial model used to promote energy efficiency and uh, education and consumer behavior, uh, the split incentive between uh, owner and operator building owners and building operators. Uh, it's especially important for um, uh, multifamily buildings. The uh, uh, lack of uh, predictability for the consumer income. And then uh, something that's really prominent across a lot of the research is just the, the challenge that the housing context that low, low and moderate income uh, consumers tend to find themselves in. So, one thing to, uh, that, that stands out across a lot of the research is that the causes of energy poverty are dynamic, which means that they tend to interact a lot across various factors. So a lot of low-income residents live in homes that have substandard insulation. Uh, on average, they typically have less efficient appliances, less efficient windows, less efficient lighting. and uh, because, as I mentioned, a lot of the, this population rely on un unpredictable income, they're especially vulnerable to fluctuations uh, to the, in their energy bill. So poor housing quality creates a situation where, on average, these uh, low-income consumers uh, uh, end up consuming more uh, energy per square foot, um, and proportionally, that leads to more uh, extreme swings in their uh, in their uh, the fluctuations in their bills as energy prices fluctuate. Um, the, uh, the, the effects that folks have attributed to energy poverty have um, really covered a lot of ground. So the, uh, the effects include things from illness and morbidity um, due to uh, ailments like asthma, stroke, and heart attacks. Um, but a lot of that goes back upstream again to um, the home envelope where poor air quality, water leaks, and accumulation of mold um, all kind of tie back at some level to um, poor quality uh, housing characteristics. Um, and when it comes to kind of mitigating these, these uh, uh, energy burden effects, um, there are a number of challenges that have been identified. The two that we'll probably focus on the most in this conversation, one is just strictly the, the lack of appropriateness of the financial models for helping folks with for helping all consumers with um, financing, retrofits, adoption, for promoting um, better uh, in-home plug load behavior, and uh, uh, that, the, the, that, that the appropriateness of those current models for all consumers doesn't fit well to the, the low-income consumer. And then secondly, this you'll see in the bottom right-hand quarter of the, the graphic, strictly speaking, the, um, the accessibility of low-income consumers is very low. But the, what the, the, the preponderance of studies show is it's not actually a, that's not a characteristic of low-income consumers. It's actually a characteristic, it's a, it's a consequence of how, um, how outreach and marketing has been conducted and not then gone back and tailored for 
different consumer segments. So it's certainly possible to um, impact and reach out to these consumers, but doing so requires more direct attention. So uh, next thing, uh, next topic we want to highlight here. Um, so low and moderate um, income, con uh, income consumers have different and unique uh, consumption profiles. And they respond to um, programmatic interventions and to, uh, utility bill prices in a in a different way than non LMI consumers. So that's something that's been well established. Um, so uh, there are uh, a, a number of different ways that you can look at it. But a fundamental thing that we found was that maybe five uh, different. There, there are maybe five different drivers behind uh, the variation. So that would include um, the uh, household and personal discretionary income of low-income consumers, uh, their home ownership tendencies, so they tend to be um, live and reside in multifamily um, housing contexts, the uh, efficiency of the house of the housing envelope, uh, their occupancy patterns and patterns of activity tend to be um, quite um, distinguished from non-LMI consumers. And then an interesting one that's come uh, into greater focus in recent years um, would be the, uh, the medical needs and attention that is required for uh, low and moderate income consumers. So things like having uh, household oxygen uh, and uh, sensitivities to hot, heat, and cool. Um, those things stand out as factors that um, interact with interventions to try to change on uh, consumer behavior. Now, so while some of these fundamental studies are understanding a lot more about what what drives the changes between uh, high and low income consumers, uh, uh, those, those fundamental insights are coming together. But where we're not seeing a lot of um, a lot of focus is around the actual kind of whole picture of what uh, what a consumer looks like. So when you include all of the um, the contextual factors around where they live and, and who they are, their the pricing, the kind of electricity price or um, thermal energy pricing prices, um, as well as the socio demographics, um, that the perspective of looking at those things together rather than in isolation is more or less missing from the discussion right now. So. When it comes to behavior change, there's uh, fairly little. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped ahead. There's not a whole lot of. Uh, again, I skipped ahead. There's. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I keep seeing a different slide. They, uh, the uh, LMI, the approaches for behavior change have become more and more sophisticated over the the last couple, of, the the last handful of years, but that hasn't been brought again, down to um, low and moderate income consumers. So behavior change strategies for um, pushing or nudging consumers to consume differently or adopt differently haven't been adequately um, cross-purposed for low income consumers. And uh, this last bit here, the, that rebound effects tend to be much higher for uh, low income consumers. And kind of our interesting take looking across the studies that show the uh, um, focus on rebound effects um, is actually that, yes, the effects are higher, but it tends to show a lack of, uh, of uh, match between the amount of um, comfort and quality of life that uh, low-income consumers are uh, trying to get out of their uh, utility service. Uh, and so when you see a rebound effect where consumption goes up following uh, energy efficiency or some other kind of retrofit, it tends to reflect a uh, uh, pent-up demand. So uh, that's some that's a an aspect of that conversation that's become more prominent recently. So uh, the next few slides are going to take a slightly deeper dive into a couple of the um, meaningful interventions and and uh, behavior strategies. I touched a little bit on this a minute ago, uh, but where programs to show efficacy is in uh, is when LMI strategies focus on a kind of a people-centered approach. 
So an example of a people-centric, uh, people-centric approach would be leveraging the, the trust and credibility of c local community-based organizations uh, when you're promoting, uh, you know, a, a adoption of efficiency retrofits, or when you're promoting um, the, the potential for savings from um, from a, a program or a service. So that that would be in contrast to a less people-centric approach, which would be the kind of interventions that focus on cost effectiveness and uh, or or you know technology and widgets. Um, so those things tend to be less effective, whereas focusing on the people-centered approach that builds trust and understanding education um, tend to tend to be more effective for low and moderate income consumers. Just briefly uh, regarding strategies, um, this list shows a, a few of the effective. Um, behavior to strategies that have been shown that, that were illustrated across a, a number of different studies. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the um, items on this list reflect the efforts to kind of repurpose existing resources more directly to attend to uh, low and moderate income consumers. So that's something that, uh, that seems to kind of uh, be cultivated across a number of different uh, of the research topics that we are uh, exploring here. That that um, that tying something in directly to low and moderate income consumers uh, tends to be the missing piece rather than a fundamental difference between low income and, and non low income consumers. So, um, turning to policy, uh, policy research and exploration, policy demonstration of new uh, experimental interventions, things like that has been uh, uh, not a significant focus of the current research. So um, there, are, there are maybe three exceptions. So uh, one exception would be uh, uh, policy around um, renewables and low and moderate income consumers. Renewables are uh, more, a, a more recent kind of uh, policy focus overall. Another is cross-coordination and streamlining of resources across agencies and um, uh, uh, and utilities and from higher and lower level um, implementation, and then rates. So rates are a topic we'll get into uh, in a subsequent slide. But uh, uh, regarding uh, cross-subsidization, um, the ideas that are circulating around how to better streamline, uh, uh, streamline uh, allocations for low-income low consumers are things like matching up the funding um, between uh, energy efficiency um, subsidy programs, between HUD, which has its own program, and Department of Energy that has its own program and funding streams, and putting those uh, and aligning kind of the um, implementation of those funding sources. Separately, um, there's a fair bit of focus around transitioning to um, uh, supportive policies to make uh, all of the um, energy efficiency, any sort of um, policy for mediating uh, energy burdens, focus more on to, to be more outcomes oriented, and also to, in some circumstances, include more non energy benefits. So, energy programs that produce benefits that um, go beyond the essential um, near term energy benefits. So, um, Let's see. Uh, rates, uh, rates are one of the more interesting areas um, for uh, uh, research around low and moderate income consumers at this point. So just a little bit of context here. There is a, 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 a substantial activity in the electricity market right now moving from um, uh, block rate moving from uh, block rate rates to um, time varying rates or time of use rates. And that focus have shifted, has shifted a number of um, interesting um, research organizations to look at the implications for low income consumers. Um, so overall, um, uh, the, the high level takeaway is that the perspective around um, dynamic pricing or time of use pricing has evolved from being fairly contentious to being uh, kind of more squarely coming down in favor of the potential benefits for low-income consumers from changing uh, rate structures to uh, uh, 
be a time varying uh, standpoint. And in, uh, in, in one situation, this tends to be because they, uh, the inelasticity of their uh, of, uh, demand from low income consumers is also coupled with uh, a fairly flat load profile. So um, the, uh, the results of the studies looking at time varying rates for low income consumers tends to show that the, the flatness of their load profile actually um, coincides with a lower net impact than the average consumer. So they actually end up um, not being as uh, hard done by than, uh, than other consumers without, uh, without much input on their part. Again, that's the perspective of the studies that we, we reviewed. We haven't done any um, of our own validation of those, uh, of those findings. So there's very little um, research out there currently around uh, customer choice uh, customer choice markets. So um, some of the uh, suggestions out there about creating better retail markets for low income um, consumers um, focus on uh, basically stabilizing prices. But at this point, uh, low, uh, uh, customer choice markets is basically a, a place where we see a lot of opportunity and need for um, follow on study. And then um, just a final point here on rates. One of the one of the areas where there's been a lot of focus has been on the equity, the fairness of the, the equity question, or the fairness of how ratepayer funds are used to promote um, uh, distributed generation or smart grid um, technologies, um, and issues around um, um, subsidizing and cross-subsidizing um, technology push programs. So uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Dana to go on and talk a little bit more about some of the other topics we, we explored. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so yeah, now I think I'd like to talk a little bit about the programs themselves. Um, so utilities generally need to meet certain metrics to support low-income customers and demonstrate results, um, and doing that while limiting financial impact on, on ratepayers themselves, which can prove to be uh, quite, quite a balancing act. Um, state and federal policy around this topic has really been active for many years, but recently there have been calls to innovate. Um, including coordination across utilities, across uh, territories, and even across various sectors, um, especially, I think, specifically including, including the housing sector and bringing affordable housing in, into the discussion. Um, programs can take on many different forms, uh, some of which are, are listed here on the slide. Um, and it's worth mentioning that incorporating the non-energy benefits that, that Eric mentioned a few minutes ago um, can really diversify and improve offerings and have real potential for sustainable returns uh, through health, economic, and social uh, outcomes if incorporated correctly. Um, in particular, weatherization investment could be benefited, benefited by um, stimulating both including energy and non-energy uh, benefits in, in calculations. This could really diversify and improve offerings, um, provide direct corporate benefits, consumer insights, um, and improve effectiveness of marketing and targeting efforts, as Eric was mentioning earlier. Demand uh, response is an interesting topic, and it's really had uh, kind of a, a mixed uh, performance record in the research with, with LMI consumers. Some studies have shown that uh, the consumers are less suitable participants. Um, for example, because low-income consumers can be more cost-conscious, they may um, already have uh, may use high-load appliances like um, air conditioning more sparingly in the first place. Uh, so there's less room room for for change there. Um, additionally, consumers are presumed to have uh, just uh, normal. Uh, less elasticity in their load uh, profile due to housing size, um, age of housing, and lack of, of energy efficiency retrofits. On the other hand, uh, there are um, studies out there showing that low-income consumers um, are saving significant amounts in some cases due to demand response. Um, and some argue that's because they're in a better position to appreciate the savings. Um, so that, that's really an area where the, the jury's still out and, and more research and study is required. There are uh, several different financing models out there um, for, for financing programs explored in the literature. Um, these include programs like on-bill financing, 
uh, customer-wide system benefits charges like the Light Up Texas uh, program I mentioned that's no longer available in this state. Um, and then also, you know, options for increasing taxes and utilities um, based contracting. Um, these are, are reviewed in more detail uh, in, in the paper. And then also uh, worth mentioning that came up several times was uh, partnerships with community-based organizations. Um, these have really seemed to have gained popularity. Um, local networks can include churches, universities, local businesses, as well as food banks, uh, community action agencies. Um, and working through these channels uh, can really build trust within the community and increase effectiveness of programs, um, leveraging existing expertise and, and good relationships within, within, uh, within communities. We also noticed that many uh, groups are working to develop uh, turnkey approaches um, that can include access to financing, assessment, incentives, and assistance all available through the same channel, uh, kind of as a, a one-stop shop for access to low-income energy services. Um, these networks, we think, provide interesting models, um, and they can serve as convening functions for coordinating policy um, and regulatory uh, items with, with program implementation. Now, of course, with, with any program, well-informed design is crucial to meeting uh, performance targets including targets of penetration and cost effectiveness. Um, but low income, low to moderate income programs can be especially complicated. Key methodologies for design implementation include utilization of benchmarking tools, uh, focus on quality assurance, and um, as Eric mentioned earlier, incorporating demographic information into program design and, uh, and distribution channels can be especially important. There's a lot of focus uh, out there on the importance of quality data and financial tracking through program life cycles. Um, investment and evaluation uh, is, is required to make sure that programs are effective at scale, um, but evaluation itself can be challenging. Uh, protocols have to be tailored uh, based on certain uh, given building types, types of retrofits, and occupancy situations. Um, but then we also have to take into account uh, macro effects, market conditions like the economy, weather, um, and also con consumer attitudes. There are some really uh, innovative design models out there uh, that are being piloted and, and implemented. Um, these can include coupling energy efficiency measures to reduce consumption uh, with uh, bill credits based on distributed generation assets, for example. And another example is um, low-income weatherization customers may also benefit from automatic enrollment in other low-income-based services, and kind of going back to that one-stop shop model. Um, and then there, there are models out there for creative access to project capital um, that can include the recognition of value through energy savings um, and subsidy deferment. Um, and then, of course, also going back to the incorporating the non-energy benefits that we, we've mentioned previously is a, another critical factor here. So, so far we've been talking a lot about um, what we found from what's out there. Uh, now we wanted to focus a little bit of attention on, um, on what's lacking in the research. There are a number of important topics that we've identified that haven't been, well, that either haven't been sufficiently studied or are emerging issues um, and consistent findings aren't yet fully formed. Uh, firstly, we need more and better data on energy conservation behavioral impacts, um, which should include focus on the understanding of motives and barriers um, affecting the topic. Um, and this can be enhanced by studying the effects of real-time usage data. We think these, these two are, are critically important. Um, demographics, we've, we've come to over and over again uh, in, in various aspects of, of the work. Um, but it's a key area that needs further research. We need a better understanding of low-income consumers by, by specific community and the association between customer types, program acceptance, response, and retention. If we could compare program demographics with U.S. Census data, we can help determine whether underrepresented groups are, are being adequately engaged by our existing programs. 
Um, multi multifamily retrofit performance is another area that came up needing additional uh, attention that the where the uh, additional study is needed. Um, and then, as Eric mentioned, time of use rates and prepay programs um, are both a bit contentious and relatively new entrants to the electricity markets, and um, as of yet are are understudied. Um, and then also, as, as we mentioned, rebound effects um, are an interesting opportunity. Um, we do need to understand the magnitude of the rebounds, but we also want to understand the extent uh, to which higher than average rebound effects um, coincide with enhanced well-being needs. So making sure we're taking uh, into consideration that the non-energy benefits as well. Um, we, we've covered a lot of ground here pretty quickly, um, but there are a number of key takeaways that stand out to us as timely and important. Um, firstly, as we've mentioned, housing type and quality are major factors con contributing to energy burdens. The combination of low income, high energy demand, and poor housing quality can force difficult trade-offs between essential needs. And we're starting to view housing context as an upstream problem. Uh, because many downstream challenges are made more difficult to address, uh, including energy efficiency, cost effectiveness, AMI service participation, and vendor-led services. Um, and another upstream problem, uh, if, if you will, we think is the lack of upfront capital um, that makes addressing the, the downstream challenges more difficult. And this upstream-downstream framework um, we think is useful for starting to begin to, to organize some of the barriers at play um, to, to begin to tackle them. Another key takeaway, as we've mentioned several times, is a greater understanding of low to moderate income consumers. Um, by far, reinventing customer engagement is the most glaring and broadly agreed upon opportunity to improve service. Um, but, you know, given, given the importance of this community, LMI consumer profiles have been understudied. Um, we need to understand how LMI consumers are unique from non-LMI consumers and how they res are responsive to and affected by the power sector. And then lastly, and very importantly, there are opportunities to scale up profitable LMI services. Um, we think there are also opportunities to re reimagine how rates and services are structured to benefit LMI consumers. Um, as we've discussed, incorporating non-energy benefits could, for instance, diversify and improve the spectrum of program offerings. Um, and, of course, again, we'd argue that these programs would be most effective when nested with a solid understanding of those low-income consumers being served. So, uh, where are we headed? <laughs> um, well, we expect to publish this working paper in a couple of weeks, and as I mentioned, um, just let us know if you'd like a copy and we'll be happy to share. Um, and uh, next, we're building the Clearinghouse Portal tool that I mentioned. Um, and that, that repository, the online repository, we hope to have available in the fall of 2017. Um, and then finally, you know, there, there's a lot here, um, a lot of continued work to be done based on this existing research. Um, and so we'd like to expand on this foundation. Um, we'd like to do a more thorough evaluation of, of best practices. Um, as well as some, some qualifications of the studies that are out there, um, and additionally, a gap, a gap analysis that may help us focus some of our future research efforts. Um, and then, of course, we, we welcome your suggestions uh, for, for our work going forward. And then finally, speaking of uh, the need for, for de better demographics information, um, I would like to give a quick preview of where uh, TEPRI is headed next. Uh, the Texas Low Income Profile Series um, is a statewide study to, to do just that for Texas. Uh, we'll be developing a detailed population uh, data study by geography and market segment um, that will examine factors related to demographics, discretionary income, household structure, housing type, and health. Um, and ultimately, we intend for this work to be utilized to reduce barriers to outreach and education that we've mentioned, um, to be used to increase program effectiveness, um, and then, of course, evaluate, uh, further evaluate policy and funding requirements to better serve the community. We're actively seeking funding and partnerships for that project, so again, please, please let us know if you'd like to get involved. Um, thank you all very much for your time. That's, uh, that's the presentation. Again, here's our contact info, and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. 
um, if you'd like the, the presentation, the, the forthcoming paper, or if you have comments, and um, we'll be happy to take any questions the group might have. Great, thank you so much, Dana and Eric. Um, it looks like there are uh, two questions that have been typed into the chat window. Um, the, the first one um, from Jason was, how does renewable energy play a role in the potential cost savings? Um, it, I saw a lot of poverty in areas in West Texas, which is a good region for solar. So uh, let, let me tell you a couple things. So first, uh, currently um, in our study, what we saw a lot of were ideas and kind of um, a few small demonstration projects, primarily around um, community solar. Um, but reading between the lines, what's not clear is how well um, the kind of uh, so the alternative solar models for including low low income consumers have been successful in doing that. Um, so I know uh, based on my uh, my own uh, uh, work on community solar uh, for uh, both the Department of Energy and for some uh, large utilities. Most of the um, the demonstration around community solar hasn't been terribly successful. Um, there's still a lot of issues around scalability. Um, apart from uh, apart from that, there's there there isn't a lot of um, research just like that validates um, good opportunities for low income consumers to leverage renewables. So I mean that's not that's glum that's glum, but honestly that that's the only that's the honest response. We don't really see much evidence that there's a, a successful model yet for really kind of bringing low-income consumers into the fold for renewables. It's got to be a focus. It's a big focus. You see a lot of in the footnotes of studies saying, and we need to figure out how to make this more equitable, or mm -hmm. the equitability issue is going to be a problem when we start getting to scale and things like that. But uh, currently, there's not a lot. There's not a lot um, for uh, renewables deployment that's been terribly effective for bringing in low-income consumers. And I, I think I'll just add to that. Um, I think the um, you know upfront capital, of course, continues to be a barrier. And until we find um, creative financing mechanisms um, for you know rooftop PV, even I think that that will continue to be an issue. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is I know there's some talk of, of not just community solar but community scale solar um, by um, I believe uh, Rock Mountain Mountain Institute and others are, are kind of exploring models there. So. Um, we are absolutely interested where there are opportunities um, for innovative models that work to bring solar to low income in, in developing case studies and, and understanding the effects on consumers, both in terms of cost reduction, but then also in terms of behavioral impacts. Um, and, you know, are there, there changes in, in consumption patterns based on the fact of, you know, of going green or participating in renewable energy technology? Okay, great. Yeah, uh, the, the the next question really was kind of along the same lines, and 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 Eric uh, kind of sadly answered it uh, that that there weren't many opportunities for these uh, LMI consumers to access the um, the solar programs. But um, the next question was from James Ornstein uh, or Ornstein, perhaps, um, and it, it was a little bit more lengthy, uh, but he was curious about the um, Encore's uh, new rate case, and uh, and essentially it looks like the particular the proposal for a new minimum charge for residential distributed energy resources. Uh, it says since Encore's argument is that if DER customers don't pay a minimum charge in order to make up for the revenue lost, uh, then the rate payers as a whole will be unfairly uh, penalized. Do you have any in you know any thoughts on that? It, it might be might be easiest to to read the comment yourself. Yeah. Oh, sure. I'll uh, I'll just add sort of a brief comment, and then James, I'll be happy to uh, to maybe discuss further offline if you'd like. Um, but I, I do think this is a very interesting issue because, and it, it's one that's brought up a lot in in discussions, um, equitability discussions recently. Because um, you know, a, as you mentioned, of course, the, the the cost of the the grid, the infrastructure, is still there, and a lot of those costs are borne by by ratepayers. 
and so you know even without adding addition additional infrastructure I, I think that you, you can certainly make that argument is that more, as more and more people um, participate in distributed energy resources if they're not paying for the infrastructure of the rates that 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 infrastructure is still required so yes I, I think it is it is an issue um, and and one that we'd like to, to pay special attention to I think um, the good news, at least in my opinion, is it's one that's being discussed pretty actively. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see where it where it goes. But I think the, the you know frankly our role and others are to make sure that we're highlighting issues like that and vulnerabilities that are exposed, um, and and making sure that the uh, low income consumers aren't aren't vulnerable uh, in the energy transition. So. Uh, and let me jump in just with a a, a different perspective from. Uh, uh, kind of the broader conversation around what's going on with trying to capture the uh, the fixed cost recovery um, that coincides with uh, increased renewables on the grid. Um, the approach that Encore is taking is one of the one of the um, uh, kind of market models that's being kind of taken for a test drive right now. But there are, uh, I think, the the more prom the more prominent transition right now is actually moving toward what Austin Energy does, which is the value of solar or which is also known in some other areas as value of generation or value of distributed generation where you have kind of a left hand and a right hand column. Left hand, you put all the, the costs, right hand, you put all the benefits and you use a function. And every year the utility trues up what the benefit and the cost is so that your actual what you're paid for your solar includes kind of taking out some of the costs for being having a two-way system. Uh, that's where they're going in. Uh, the entire state of New York will be replacing, uh, they just announced late last year, they'll be replacing their net energy metering with value of what they call VOD, which is like a value of distributed generation, whereas we have value of solar. Minnesota is doing that um, as well, um, I, and several other states are considering it time varying rates are being used to circumvent this issue as well. So in California, solar consumers are being required to move to um, a suite of time varying rates um, uh, beginning this year, actually. So they will no longer be able to use volumetric rates. Um, so uh, Encore's approach is one, uh, one way that it's done. Um, and, and there are a lot of arguments out there about which of these is, you know, uh, most kind of directly tied to costs, which is most equitable, uh, which is best for the intersection of public benefit for all consumers with the uh, uh, rate payer equity questions. Um, but uh, I would be interested in following up with that as well if you have any, if you want to talk more about that. Okay, uh, just just we'll put out one one final uh, request. Are there are there any other questions from from those who uh, who are are still listening? So yeah, the solar host. So there's a question right now about um, CPS Energy Solar Host Program. Um. So yeah, we uh, we uh, know the CPS folks um, pretty well here. Um, and I, let's see, I think there's a second part of your question here. Like, munis are different than the deregulated areas of Texas because they don't allow third-party ownership um, to purchase systems. So uh, the solar host program is definitely um, near first of kind. There's another program like that uh, for Tucson Electric Power. Um, which is a, a different model, but a similar, but the one that's most similar to San Antonio's. The results are out on both of those right now in terms of how effective they are. But we're definitely um, interested in seeing how they perform, how how it performs. Um, and then also, just uh, the second part of your question surrounds like the third party leasing model. Um, and and just a a little bit of context there as well. Part of the rationale behind not including. Um, third party ownership is actually some of the, the value, the, the perception that uh, the value to the, uh, the solar adopter is lower in a, in a lease structure than an ownership structure. 
So um, some, I don't know, I don't know particularly about the munis in Texas, but I know that the rationale for some public utilities and municipal utilities is actually that for customers who adopt solar, they want most of the benefit to stay for the utility and for the customer and not to go to a third party. So that's part of the rationale there as well as that you kind of get a little bit of cream skimming um, when you integrate a, a third party provider. So my understanding is uh, I, I think that even even here in Austin, Solar City's um, going to be uh, providing uh, solar contracts soon. So um, I don't know how I don't know how long term that um, that kind of uh, tendency here in Texas is going to stick around. Wow. Well, great. Thank, thanks for uh, providing all that information, Eric. That was um, quite in depth. Uh, and 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 thank you again to to both yourself and Dana for uh, this talk. Uh, for those of you who um, maybe have have uh, colleagues who might be interested, we we've recorded this talk and we'll be putting a video up on our, on our YouTube channel, and that will be shared on on our website nextgenpv.org and uh, and and on our social pro, uh, channels. And I'm sure that Dana and Eric will will uh, probably have um, have it available in, in, in their uh, social or, or websites as well. So thank you again to you both, and thank you uh, for everyone for for tuning in. And uh, look forward to having. Oh, it looks like I'm kind of muted. Uh, we'll look forward to having uh, these two back, uh, perhaps sometime in the future, to give us a a, a further update. Thank you very much, John. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.